Welcome, everyone, to the Schaeffer Lecture in Public Policy. I'm Ron Mangan. I'm the Dean of the Division of Social Sciences here, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the fifth annual Schaeffer Lecture in Public Policy. My predecessor, Steve Schaeffer, and his wife, Anjali, uh, established the Schaeffer Lectures in Public Policy with a generous gift to the college in 2008. Steve and Anjali are here for tonight's lecture with their daughter, Mira, or she may be in traffic. And I'd like to ask them to stand, please, so we can thank them with our warm applause. Thank you so much. I'd also like to recognize our provost, Ralph Hexter, who's here this evening. And uh, thanks for coming, Ralph. There's also several deans in the audience besides myself, but I think I won't get the list right and I'll leave somebody out. So hello, deans. Thank you for coming. <laughs> the Shefferns endowed this lecture series because they wanted to give a gift that would benefit the entire Division of Social Sciences. And this is very much in keeping with Steve's commitment to excellence for every department and program in the Division of Social Sciences. He was dean for 10 years, the longest serving dean of social sciences. And I don't know what, I, six years now, and I don't know how you did it. Second, it reflects the Shefferns' own long-standing interest in public policy. Steve's an internationally known macroeconomist and expert in tax policy. Anjali received her PhD in economics from UC Davis in 1981 and served in the utility and energy sector for more than 25 years. The Sheffern Lecture Endowment supports an annual lecture on topics related to the social sciences and public policy that have broad relevance to our students, our faculty, and the wider university community. Over the past four years, the Sheffer and Lecture Fund has brought distinguished scholars from across the social science disciplines to UC Davis to share their work on healthcare reform, government secrecy, immigration, and polarization in American politics. Each of these talks has informed our thinking on the day's most relevant issues of national public policy. Tonight, Professor Sen Hill Millenithan, he told me I couldn't pronounce it wrong, actually, no matter what I did. I appreciate that, thank you. A Harvard economist and MacArthur Fellow will deliver a lecture on the psychology of scarcity, which is a poignant topic as our country continues to recover from the worst economic crisis in generations. I'd like to point out the updated Sheffern Lecture plaque, which hangs in the Social Sciences Dean's office and bears a record of our lecturers. So we have added Sandhill's name to this distinguished list, so his name will have a permanent home in UC Davis. It's right outside my office. It's a privilege of being Dean. I would also like to thank the generous co-sponsors of tonight's event, which include the Institute for Social Sciences, the Herbert A. Young Society, and the UC Davis Center for Poverty Research. Now here to introduce Professor Millenathan is Ann Stevens, who in addition to her appointment as professor and chair of the Department of Economics, is the director of the Center for Poverty Research. The center was founded in 2010 as one of three national federally funded poverty research centers, along with one at Stanford and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The center's core mission is to facilitate nonpartisan research on poverty in the United States. They do this in part by promoting active exchange between, between researchers across the social science disciplines. This collaborative approach is, uh, allows us to study one of today's most pressing social problems. It's very well aligned with the purposes of the Sheffern Lectures. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Stevens, who will introduce our speaker, Anne. Thanks very much, uh, Ron, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to uh, be able to introduce Professor Sindel Mullenathan tonight. Um, as uh, Dean Mangan mentioned, he's a professor of economics at Harvard University and has been a leading scholar in the field of behavioral economics. Uh, in this uh, framework, he's explored issues ranging from cigarette taxes, CEO pay, uh, to poverty. He's also a co-founder of uh, the Poverty Action Lab at MIT, which promotes the use of randomized trials in order to um, make progress in development economics. Um, as you see from the slide, most recently he's published with uh, co-author Elder Shafir, a psychologist, this book, Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much, which looks at how scarcity of money or time or other resources affects our decision making and our focus. Um, another minor point from Sindel's bio is that I learned that in his spare time, he enjoys uh, repairing classic espresso machines. 
I have had to very carefully all day reveal, uh, conceal this fact from my colleagues in economics because our machine, as you all know, has been on the fritz for some time and I was afraid I would find him pressed into service, but he has survived without having to do that. Um, beyond espresso machine repair, uh, Sindel has, of course, been frequently recognized in and outside of academia. Uh, he's been the recipient of a prestigious MacArthur Award, um, has been named as a top 100 thinker by Foreign Policy Magazine. He's also been listed by Wired Magazine as one of 50 people who will change the world, which is a very um, <coughs> a notable accomplishment, but even more notable when I investigated a little and found that he was named to this position uh, specifically by Daniel Kahneman, Nobel laureate and pioneer in behavioral economics, so truly impressive. I think um, in economics, as Steve Sheffrin's former colleagues and with many friends in the department, we feel an especially high bar in selecting and nominating a Sheffrin lecturer, and I am uh, very confident that tonight's speaker will exceed, lead, uh, will meet that bar and exceed it. And so please join me in welcoming Professor Mullenathan. Can you guys hear me? Is this mic on? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. It's a, it's a real thrill to be here. I'm going to, um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, <clears throat> a personal problem. Uh, don't worry, this isn't going to get uncomfortable. Um, I, um, happened about four or five years ago, uh, I had, uh, I found myself in a sort of a bad situation. I had, I was um, just like grossly overcommitted. You know, I'd be running late to meetings. Sometimes I'd miss a meeting because just somehow other things got there. My car wasn't registered anymore, so as I was driving to work, I would always have to find a path on which there would be no Cambridge police officer. I even, and sometimes you'd see an officer, and you're like, I had to make a right all of a sudden. <laughs> like I could imagine, like, I, basically, I couldn't even imagine what my mom's face looked like. I hadn't called her in like weeks, months. Just overcommitted. And that was no way to be, so I had sort of made a decision. My decision was, I'm going to get it all under control. How am I going to get it all under control? I knew it wouldn't be easy. The first step I was going to take was I was going to start by saying no to everything new. That's important, right? It's like you got all this stuff coming on. The first, just no. And afterwards, eventually, with no new things coming in, the mountain of stuff in my life would start to kind of get smaller. And eventually, maybe in six months, I would be down to zero. And then it would be more judicious in what I said yes to. So it was a good plan. It felt really good. It was overconfidence always feels good. And um, <clears throat> so I decided to implement the plan. And I, was, and I told Elder all about it. And I don't know if he gave a shit, but he listened. But a week later, I, told Eldar, I called Eldar and said, hey, Eldar, um, Really good news. Uh, a friend of ours is writing, is putting together this very interesting book on poverty, and uh, uh, maybe we should put a chapter in that book. And Eldar, apparently, as you might see, there's some inconsistency in that. Uh, Eldar also saw it. Apparently, I didn't see it. There was no irony in my voice, and uh, you can see that my plan failed. But in a funny way, it sort of succeeded. I mean, you know, you have to have some amount of overconfidence. It succeeded because of something that was in that chapter that we did, in fact, end up writing despite being overcommitted. And that chapter <clears throat> involved uh, the poor and how the poor manage their lives. And so in there, we were sort of trying to synthesize uh, qualitative stories about time, uh, money management by the poor. And you know, one of the things that comes up often is this. These are payday loans. I don't know if you guys know what a payday loan Does everyone here know what a payday loan is? A payday loan is a, is a loan that you can get a loan against your salary. It might last for about a week or two weeks so that when your next paycheck comes in, you can pay it off. And it might be $200 in size, and you might end up paying $25, $50 in fees. So as you can see, that's a very high effective interest rate for a two-week loan. This is a very common industry. I think there are probably uh, more payday loan companies in the United States, more payday loan locations in the U.S. than Starbucks and McDonald's. Uh, locations combined. Um, so there's a lot of them. Uh, and in there, when you hear, read about payday lenders, you know, here's a common story. So you'll read about somebody or you'll meet somebody who will be 
taking a payday loan in order to pay off their last payday loan, plus the interest. And that was used to pay off the one before. And they'll be paying off payday loan from six cycles before. And it's not just that. They might have two, three of these now. And their whole life is under a mountain of debt. And you'll read this person, and you'll see what they're doing, and you'll see like, oh, they're doing all this, and they're stuck in this debt trap. And what do they do? They go out, and they'll like buy like a leather jacket or something. And you'll be like, ah, come on, that's just ridiculous. But at that point, that ridiculousness actually quite paralleled my ridiculousness. After all, you could argue that that person is money poor, but what was I but time poor? You could argue that person was deeply in money debt. What was I but deeply in time debt? What is all the commitments we have, those things we said yes to, but the incurring of a time debt? And much like I couldn't get myself out of my time debt, this person couldn't get themselves out of their money debt. So there's kind of a, a, a similarity here between the money poor and the time poor. And there are actually quite a few similarities. For example, people might say to the money poor, given what you owe, how could you buy that? You could just as easily say to the time poor, given everything you have to do, why are you playing Angry Birds? <laughs> there's something else, too, which is when you're poor, the most basic of goods can become luxuries. Your kid's doing very well in school. Their birthday's coming up. You want to buy them a really nice gift. But now that purchase of a gift is a luxury. You're very busy. You have a deadline coming up. You'd like to take some time off and spend with your kids. But now that also is a luxury. The poverty, in this sense, transformed the choices. So in some sense, this is the beginning of this what I'm going to tell you today, that and this analogy between the money poor and the time poor is not just a superficial analogy, that there is something connecting these two things, that there's a notion of scarcity, a feeling of having too little, and that this feeling of having too little actually changes the way you think and the way your mind operates, and that if we want to understand why I was stuck in a time trap, if we want to understand why the poor might be stuck in a debt trap, if we want to understand the behavior of people across these forms of scarcity, we don't need to look at the individual person and, and ascribe anything to them. That maybe they're all connected by understanding the psychology of how we change when we have too little. So that's what I'm going to try and assert to you today. Okay, and that's going to be my assertion. And so to help you understand what the psychology of scarcity is, or the science of scarcity, if you might want to call it that, I want to go to something totally, um, totally different. Um, I want to go back to World War II. So this is around 1943. And in 1943, the Allies were reconquering large parts of Europe. 1944. So at that point, they were discovering starving people. And they wanted to figure out, well, what do we do about this? Now, they had all the food. So the Allies were in a very good position. We had a ton of food. So feeding these people was not the problem. The problem was, how should we feed them? Here's someone who's been starving, at the edge of starvation. Do we just give them as much food as they want? Maybe the system will go into shock. Do we instead maybe give them a little bit and keep increasing what we give them? That was the question they had. So they went to the researchers at the time, and they said, hey, what do we do about this? And the researchers said, we have no idea, but let us run an experiment. These Some things haven't really changed. And so this was the University of Minnesota, and the Minnesota start, uh, uh, study started. And that study recruited a large amount of men, and they got a lot of people to volunteer. It took about 30 of them, 20-something. And they said, OK, here's the study. So what did they do? So how do you figure out how to refeed starving people? So the first step is you have to take healthy people, and you have to starve them. So here's a subject in the study. And there he is early on. It's actually not even fully into the starvation period. And uh, some of you may, you can just see from the picture, that this guy's got a long way to go. I don't know if you guys can see why. I'll tell you why in a second. So a lot of, forget refeeding, a lot of what we know about hunger, we learned from this study, actually. They kept copious notes, detailed notes about people. And <clears throat> so for example, some of it is obvious. I'll tell you some things. Like it turns out that if you starve people, uh, they get thinner, they lose weight. Some of it is not obvious. And that's actually how you know this is only partway through the study. If you keep starving them, they actually gain weight again. It actually goes down and then back up. And that's edema. 
you see his stomach would start to swell up with water retention, and he hasn't started that process yet. Some of it is psychological stuff, you know, is kind of obvious too. It turns out that if you starve people, they get very cranky and angry and upset. They're not happy. No surprise there. But there are some non-obvious things. On the physical end, I think for me what was striking was how severe the loss in muscle was. For example, the men could no longer shampoo their hair because they couldn't, their traps and their triceps had deteriorated so much, they couldn't lift their hands above their head. Oh, graphic. But perhaps most interesting, for the purpose of what I'm going to tell you today, is the mindset. So how can we see the, the mindset of these men change? Not just that they didn't just get cranky and angry and so on, that's obvious, but something more fundamental happened. So let me, let me give you a few facts that might give you a sense of it. So the first is that what did these men do with their free time? They would leaf through cookbooks. Now, when you're hungry, not such a good idea, but that's what they did. Here's another thing. When they surveyed the men and said, hey, when you leave this study, what are you going to do? Over, I think, a half of, over half of them, maybe over two-thirds of them, said, I'm going to start a restaurant. Now, I don't want to ruin the study for you in case you're going to read the study, but, so, spoiler alert, but none of them started a restaurant. <laughs> Perhaps most indicative, there was a time when the, uh, one of the researchers related this anecdote. All these men went to watch a movie, Friday night, this was in Minnesota, small town Minnesota, so all the men sat in one corner, that corner over there, the rest of the town people sat over here, and they were watching this movie. It's a movie from the, the, the early 40s, so it was like a romantic comedy, and a classic, you know, these were all great movies. And so there was, you know, it was funny, and whenever there was a punchline, everybody would laugh, the men would laugh. And the researcher noted, every once in a while there'd be a punchline, and everyone else would be laughing. But that corner of the theater would be dead silent. The researcher thought, that's really weird. What is it about these jokes that these men just don't like them and that everybody else obviously likes them? And eventually, he pieced it together. Whenever there was food on the screen, the men didn't even hear the punchline. All of this just goes to show something kind of interesting about hunger and about scarcity more generally. That what does it do when we lack something that we need? Our mind automatically orients towards it. In fact, that's even the wrong phrasing. The mind orienting towards it suggests some sort of top-down me looking at it. It's not that. It captures us. Food. Well, let me give you an example of how powerful this concept is by using a totally different study. This is a study from 60 years later. And it's a very different kind of study. It's not 30 men and, and qualitative observations. It's a study uh, that's done by psychologists. And so here's what they did. They brought people into the lab and they said, before you show up to this experiment, we don't want you to drink anything. Like, show up thirsty for like, you know, I haven't drunk anything for six hours. Great, people showed up. And to half of them, they gave them water. And the interesting thing about psychology that I really like, I feel like I'm doing a lot of psychology these days, and perhaps I'm doing it because there is something kind of a little practical jokish about many good psychology experiments. So the other half, they gave them pretzels. <laughs> and so now you have some very thirsty people and you have some very not thirsty people. And what did they do? What they did was, they said to these people, great, we'd like you to do a very simple task. On the screen, letters are going to flash. And you are simply going to tell us whether those letters are a word or not. It's a word. It's not a word. It's a pretty simple task. Even my undergraduates could do this task. <laughs> so they'd probably cheat on it just because they could. Um, just out of habit, I suppose. Um, by the way, this, this part of the study always makes me thirsty. I'm not joking. <laughs> so why do this task? Obviously, everybody gets this right. Well, this task, as simple as it is, it's called the lexical decision task. And I think of it as one of the most beautiful discoveries of psychology because it's one of the best ways we have of looking inside somebody's brain, of actually seeing what they're thinking. Why is that? Because even though these words, everyone knows their words, the speed with which you recognize them to be words is indicative of what you're thinking about. So if we did this, uh, so we do these with the thirsty, for example, and you find the thirsty are no slower or faster to find the word chair, but they're much quicker to see that W-A-T-E-R is a word. When I say much quicker, I mean about 75 milliseconds. 75 milliseconds is really, really fast. 
It's so fast that we know it's below conscious control. So it's not that people are choosing to respond. They couldn't choose at that speed. It's that their mind is on water because they're thirsty. So now you see these two polar opposite extremes. By the way, whenever I do this, I have to tell you, the first time I made these slides, this slide, I've never changed it because I made it for a talk in Norway. And as you can imagine, when it first went up, I remember thinking to myself, wait a minute. By some blind chance, is it possible that I have just, I, I still don't know. I mean, Norwegians are very polite, so who knows? I think I must have been shopping at Ikea. But nevertheless, between these two studies, that's going to be the core of what I'm going to tell you today. The psychology of scarcity is trivial. I mean, really trivial. That when you don't have something that you need, the mind automatically is captured by that thing. When you're hungry, there's a part of you that says, hey, we're hungry. I don't know if you got that last message I sent, or the last eight text messages I sent you, but we're hungry. That keeps calling out to you that your mind automatically, you see the food immediately, everything that you lack. And these are physical processes, but that this is true of everything. That the poor, for example, are automatically captured by saying, how will I make rent this month? You're sitting here quietly. You may not have money needs. If you were poor, part of your mind would keep going through, my God, how will I make rent this month? Not because that's what you want to be thinking about. That's not an exciting topic, but that is what your mind goes to. If you're busy and you have a deadline on a paper tomorrow, your mind may keep going to be called by, oh my God, I have to make this deadline. I have to make this deadline. That's it. That's the psychology of scarcity. It's fairly simple, and that's what I'm going to build this science of scarcity around. And so I remember telling a colleague of mine that I'm working on sort of this science of scarcity. He listened and said, oh, that's very interesting. He said, you know, there's already a science of scarcity. You might have heard of it. It's called economics. <laughs> now, oddly enough, I had heard of it. It is a field I knew something about. And so it's worth understanding how what I'm telling you is, is actually quite different from economics. So I think the power of economics really does rely on scarcity. It's the recognition that physical scarcity is everywhere. If we build a bridge, that is that much less money to do something else. If we spend so much to save somebody's life suffering from a particular disease, that is less money to spend on something else. It's not a particularly pleasant message. Unfortunately, it's a true message that there are trade-offs. The physical scarcity is ubiquitous. <clears throat> so how is that different from what I'm going to tell you today? Well, let me tell you too with a story. This is. Um, this is one of Doug's favorite cocktails, so I decided to put that up there. So this is a cocktail. So imagine you went out to, to have uh, dinner with a friend. And the waiter or waitress comes to you and says, hey, before dinner, would you like a cocktail? We have this special cocktail on the menu. You listen to it, and you're, and you're thinking, huh, should I buy that? Just think for a minute about everything that would come to mind. What are all the things that you would think about in buying that? So, whoa, name some stuff. All right? Can I afford it? Yep, what else? What am I going to eat? Will this go well with my blank? How many calories? What? <laughs> oh, there we go. Look at that. Wow, that's very interesting. What does it cost? That's really how I afford it. Will I be driving home? Am I going to be drinking alone? I mean, sure, that was fun in the morning, but maybe now I'm getting home alone. <laughs> Those are all the kind of questions you might be asking yourself. There's one question, however, that you don't ask yourself. Which actually is funny because a poor person does ask themselves this question. In fact, in our data, when we ask the poor questions such as this, they spontaneously ask this question, and rich people don't. To understand what this question is, pretend now that you're on a diet, and some of you may be on a diet. Now, what question would you ask? You might ask, how many calories does it have? There's another question you would ask. If I have this drink, what will I not have? Now, it's funny. You don't ask yourself, if I buy this cocktail, what will I not buy? When you're well off, that even feels like a ridiculous question. What do you mean, what will I not buy? I have money in my bank account. I can buy anything I want. Actually, economics tells you correctly, of course you can't. There is a physical trade-off. I hate to break it to you, but $10 spent one somewhere will mean 10 less dollars elsewhere. But it doesn't feel like that. And that's the difference between the psychology of scarcity and the economics of scarcity. In economics, scarcity is correctly ubiquitous. It's an accounting identity. 
$10 less on this cocktail or $10 less elsewhere. But the psychology of scarcity is not that. You can feel abundance. For example, you go for a jog, you lose $20, you don't say, oh my god, what, will I not, not, what, will I, what can I not buy anymore? You get annoyed at yourself for losing $20. But when you're experiencing scarcity, when you're that dieter, you suddenly feel that trade-off. You suddenly feel that constraint. And that's what I want you guys to understand, that the psychology of scarcity is what I'm going to be talking about today. The feeling, the sense that now I have too little, and as a consequence, the constant bringing to mind of the thing that you lack. It's a very simple statement, and I won't talk. I've given you some evidence on the thirsty. I've given you some evidence on the hungry. You can show this for the poor. You can show, for example, if you have the poor, simply complete the following word, C-A blank blank. What word finishes that? What you'll find is that the poor are much more likely to complete that as cash rather than cars. So there's sort of a set of studies much like this, you can show that, in fact, the poor are often thinking about money-related things. So take that as given. But let's ask, what does this get us? Such an obvious hypothesis. OK, so the first thing I want you to talk about is to go back to time. And I want to just observe something. I want you to think a little bit about how you yourself are when you have both abundance of time and scarcity of time. So imagine you have two months to write a chapter of some book. How do you work two months from that deadline? You sit down, you say, okay, I'm gonna write. And you say, but before I write, maybe I should check some email. I mean, why not? But anyway, since you're already checking email, what about ESPN? I mean, you just have to know what happens. Before you know it, it's lunchtime. So now you go for lunch, you linger on, you know, with a friend, when are you gonna see this friend again? So you decide to have dessert and coffee, and now it's two in the afternoon, and you see where the day goes. Now, when it's a week before the chapter is due, you're completely focused. You're on target. You don't even think about checking email. Or if you do, you say, forget this, I got something to do. Angry Birds doesn't even enter your field of vision. You might skip that lunch, or you might go to that lunch and come back on time. Why is that? Well, there is a huge benefit to having a part of your brain constantly call you up and say, let's focus on this. We need to get this done. We need this. There is a huge benefit to scarcity. I started by talking about the downside, but let's first just remember, there is a huge upside. And this is why studies find, for example, the people, when they work on deadlines, they're just much more productive. You don't, I don't need to tell you this study, you know it. And in fact, at the end of every deadline, you always think to yourself the same thing. Why can't I be this productive all the time? That's the psychology of scarcity. In fact, this shows up everywhere. Let me tell you about Connie Gersick. Connie Gersick <clears throat> is an um, um, organizational behavior researcher. And I know most of you think to yourself, gosh, I go to so few meetings. I'd love to go to more meetings. How can I have a job where I go to more meetings? That's Connie Gersick's job. She studies meetings. Exciting. In fact, she has studied a lot of meetings. Meetings by CEOs, meetings by students, meetings of every stripe and variety and length. And across all these meetings, she's found an interesting pattern. The pattern is the following. Every meeting, whatever the goal, whoever the people, all starts off the same. They start off with one person saying something, and the other person saying, oh, very good point. Let me say something related, and saying something completely unrelated. And this goes on for quite some time. <laughs> Until, at some point, and it always happens at the same point. She calls it the midpoint transition. Halfway through the meeting, people look up and go, oh shit. And then they get serious. People focus on the task. People are no longer saying these arbitrary different things. But that's the psychology of scarcity. It focuses us. Because it's not the kind of focus that we can decide to focus. It captures our attention. There's a benefit to having your attention be captured. Okay. So that's all by way of saying there is a huge benefit in focusing. That the pressing task or need is there, and that's what we see. Angry Birds falls out here. The temptation to go and do some random thing falls over there. We only see that we've got to get this deadline done. This shows up in money. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> we did a survey where we went to South uh, uh, South Station, which is a train station in Boston, and we said to people, hey, when you get into the cab, 
what does the meter start at? That's an interesting question. And we ask everybody, there were poor people, rich people. It's funny because the poor don't take cabs very often. But despite that, they're the ones who knew the answer to this question. Because they're focused. They're focused on price. They're focused on money. They know what's going on. In fact, this is something you can do for fun. Um, you go to a supermarket that's got sort of a heterogeneous income population, wait outside. And when people are coming outside, say, hey, can I do a little survey? And well, <laughs> hopefully they treat you better than they treat me. They say yes to you. Um, and then take their receipt from them. By the way, if you actually try this and something bad happens to you, I'm not responsible. <laughs> so take their receipt from them. Marketing researchers do this. So they take the receipt from them and say, okay, I've got a few questions for you. You just bought Crest toothpaste. How much was it? This is a relatively high income person. They'll say, I think it was $2. Could have been five, maybe seven. Look, I'm pretty sure it was single digits. So put me down for single digits if that's an option. <laughs> Ask a poor person, they'll say, oh, it's $2.79. It's on sale. It's normally $2.89 or $3.50. The poor know the price of things. You can even ask people, how much did you just spend? Rich people will say, 70 bucks, 90, maybe 100, somewhere in that range, 70 to 150. Kind of, <laughs> I think. This isn't a Whole Foods, is it? Anyway, <laughs> that's true, right? Isn't that crazy? Anyway, I don't know why I'm angry at Whole Foods. Um, so ask the same thing of a poor person. They'll know exactly what they spent. This is so, and I just want to reinforce this. This is the benefit of the psychology of scarcity. It focuses us. It's so extreme, for example, that it's another thing you can do in a supermarket. Go to the supermarket, walk through the aisles. I assume you guys have all been to like uh, a Costco or you know, where they sell things in huge sizes. You know, that's, that's the essence of America. Big is good. And so like, <clears throat> you can go and find toilet paper and see how much the same roll of toilet paper sells when it's 12 versus 48. And so, you know, if you buy the 48, you buy it because you'll pay less per roll. It's called a quantity discount. So next time you're in a supermarket, just go through at all the items, the tuna, the toilet paper, the rice, whatever, and just track how much did it cost for the smaller and the big size, and how big was the quantity discount. You'll find something interesting. I mean, this is economics, as interesting as it gets. No, no, no. This is actually interesting. About 20% of the time, you'll find that there's no quantity discount. There's a quantity surcharge. This is a trick. It's a trick supermarkets have. Because why? You just assume there's a quantity discount, so you just go right in and just take the big rolls of toilet paper. You'd actually be better off buying four small rolls of toilet paper. What's interesting about this is that marketing researchers have tried to predict not just how big the discount will be, but where. Where will we see these discounts? Guess what turns out to be a great predictor? The income of the neighborhood. Supermarkets in poor neighborhoods never have quantity surcharges. The poor just don't fall for that stuff. This is the reminder I'd like to put to you, is that the psychology of scarcity begins with something fundamentally good, fundamentally helpful. And if you want to think about it this way, think about it from an evolutionary biology perspective. You have an animal, and the animal is hungry or thirsty. What would you do if you were designing the brain of this animal? You would like a part of the brain that constantly says to the animal, I'm sure you, what you're doing right now you think is important, but we're hungry. Let's focus on that. Hungry. Do you remember that? And that's really what I want you to think about. That's the essence and the origin of the psychology of scarcity. So then the question really is, if it's all so good, how do we end up borrowing? How do we end up with these traps? Why do we end up in this bad situation? How does the psychology of scarcity create something so bad? One way to think about it is the following. Remember I told you you were so focused on these pre pressing needs? So you were so focused on the urgent? And wasn't it great that like Angry Birds was like outside your vision? You know what else is outside your vision? That mole on the back that needs to be checked out? That's not urgent. But guess what? It's important. That car registration sticker that needs to get fixed, that's not urgent either. I mean, it could wait one more day. The very force that provides the benefits of scarcity also shows us where it goes wrong. Because everything gets punted aside. The important gets punted aside. In fact, Stephen Covey uh, uh, has this wonderful book. 
Because I have tenure, I can admit I love this book. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. <laughs> it is a great book. I suppose it might be enough to revoke tenure, but you know, people are snobs. <laughs> I'm going with it. This is a great book. One of his things that he points out is that many ineffective people neglect the important in favor of the urgent. Like, that's the essence of being busy, and that's the essence of poorly managing your time. But notice how it follows directly from focusing. You could almost say, you're not just focusing, you're tunneling. And when you tunnel, everything falls outside that tunnel. Let's do this with money. You're poor, and you're so focused on making ends meet today. You're good. You know the price of Crest toothpaste. You're good. You know that you know, buying two rolls of toilet paper is cheaper than buying four rolls of toilet paper. You are doing a great job making ends meet today. What goes wrong? Well, rent is very hard to make meet. You're not focused on making next month's rent. That doesn't make any sense. That's even philosophical. What does that mean? You're focused on making this month's rent. So if somebody comes to you and says, it's really hard to make ends meet today, I have an idea. Here's something that will help you today and solve the problem you're working on. The cost of it, well, you've got to pay it back. But that's not what you're focused on. A loan is almost like a perfectly designed product to exploit this weakness. I'm not saying it was designed that way, but it has that feature. Its benefits appear in the tunnel. Its costs appear outside the tunnel. When you talk to borrowers who are taking payday loans, it's very tempting to think that they're foolish. They're actually not very foolish. When you ask them questions such as, how much does this payday loan cost? They'll know if this is a cheaper payday loan borrower. That's right, in here. If you ask them, how will you repay this loan? They look at you like you're an idiot. Because in a funny way, you are being an idiot. It'd be as if you were working very hard on making a conference deadline for tomorrow, and your RA comes and says, hey, um, this paper that's not due tomorrow, I have some questions on it. And you're like, are you an idiot? Have you not heard? We have this deadline tomorrow. That's what this person is thinking. I am trying to save my home. I'm trying to make sure I make rent. And you're asking me, how will I re What are you talking about? I'm fighting a fire, and you're asking me about next month's dinner. That's the essence of how I think the psychology of scarcity leads to borrowing. So what I want to tell you is, how would I test this hypothesis? See, what I'm arguing is, I'm arguing that borrowing inherently follows from scarcity. So how are we going to test this? I know it seems quite obvious, and we will, so I will, in fact, do the obvious thing and use Family Feud to test this. <laughs> I don't even think I need to explain why. I think the connection is really clear. <laughs> you guys all know what Family Feud is? Do you? Some of you. You don't? Some of you don't? Oh, oh you're missing out. I think this is one of the seven greatest American inventions. It re it's really very good. No, it's really good. Family Feud is basically a quiz show that solves the fundamental problem of all quiz shows, which is, if we're honest with ourselves, it's really weirdos who like quiz shows. I mean, who knows what the capital of that random country is? Hey, whatever. Do you read the almanac for breakfast? I mean, what are you doing? How do you know all this stuff? How do you create a quiz show for people like me and most Americans who just don't know that much? What you do is you come up with a question and you say, we're going to ask the same question to 100 randomly selected people. We're going to take their answers. And your goal is to guess their answers. There's no truth. It's democracy applied to knowledge, <laughs> right? In a way, it's very postmodern. I feel like it's well ahead of its time. So for example, this is a question from Family Feud. Name something Barbie could sell if she needed to raise money fast. Oh, come on. Don't you guys want to guess? Come on. What would you guess? Go ahead. Let's see how good. Let's play the feud. What? Car. Yes. Look at that. Number one answer is, in fact, her car. What are the other? Come on. Oh, my goodness. That is the number three answer. Look at that. That is right. That is right. You're not married to her, are you? I would... Oh, well. Not So, at number two is the shoes. So what does all this have to do with scarcity? Well, we took a bunch of undergraduates. We had them play Family Feud. And the way they played Family Feud was they would get a bunch of Family Feud questions. And, you know, answering these questions takes some time. And thinking about answers takes time. So they were given a certain amount of time for each question. But <clears throat> what we wanted to do was we wanted to study scarcity. So what did we do? Well, we gave half of them more time Half of them, very little time. So now we have the family feud rich and the family feud poor. 
Of course, these are not rich people and poor people. They're just undergraduates who are randomly assigned to being rich and poor. It's not even rich in money. It's rich in family feud seconds. Then what do we do? Well, we gave some of them the ability to borrow. We wanted to see, could we? What does borrowing mean? You can have one more second this round, but you lose two seconds from the future. 100% interest rate. We've really blown the payday loan industry out of the water. Because 100% for 40 seconds? Oh. Now, I know you're thinking these seconds aren't worth anything, but you also thought that about Bitcoin. I really feel like this is a way I'm going to get rid So what do we find? What we found was that, <clears throat> first of all, these rich people and poor people with seconds do exactly what the poor do with money. When given the ability to borrow, here's what happens. The, I, I'm colorblind, so whatever. The bottom line, blue, and the top is what, green? Is that right? Yellow? Oh, this, OK, yellow. So the yellow are the rich. The blue or the poor. And this is the percentage of each round that goes to paying off previous debts. And you can see they're just driving themselves into debt. In fact, by round 12, 65% of their income is going to paying off their prior debts. They look just like poor people or busy people. And even better, let's look at how they perform. What you find, the next graph is a little clunky, but work with me. What you find is, this is the rich. This is performance of the rich who are given the ability to borrow. They do slightly better than the rich who weren't given the ability to borrow. This is performance of the poor. When given the ability to borrow, suddenly they do much worse, much like the poor in the world. Why? The loan is exactly exploiting them. Now, it's not about time. We've done this with angry birds and giving people more or less shots and the ability to borrow shots, and all of a sudden, you'll borrow too many shots. Scarcity inherently generates borrowing. So if we go back to the original stories, now we can have family feud, and we can also say, there's a reason why I get stuck in a time trap. There's a reason why the poor get stuck in a debt trap. It's because that very force of scarcity that makes me so productive also blinds me to the consequences of debt. Debt, every form of debt, putting off a project, taking a loan, saying I'll do this later, all of those things are exactly the things that are toxic to the psychology of scarcity. Now, if that's all it was, that the psychology of scarcity gives us some immediate benefits, but it has some long-term consequences because we borrow, I think that would be an interesting story. But I think that's an incomplete story. And to understand why it's incomplete, let me talk about poverty for a little bit. I want to tell you a few facts about poverty that are quite troubling. That, and you can make many such facts. So I'll just tell you a few. The first comes from the world of, of health. So this is diabetes medication. I think I probably have a 100% chance of getting diabetes because I'm South Indian, male, and everyone in my family has it. So maybe 90%, 95% chance. <clears throat> Which is funny because I think most people in the US think of diabetes as like a disease that comes from behavior and being overweight. It's got a big genetic component as well. This is type 2 diabetes. Why am I telling you this? Because diabetes is kind of a really horrible disease. It doesn't just kill. It really kills in a terrible way. Because what's happening is the blood sugar that's too high in your system is deteriorating your body. So you go blind. Your limbs get gangrene. They have to be chopped off. Very unattractive. Very, very not good. Luckily, drugs like this, amongst the first kinds of besides sort of uh, uh, drugs to deal with infections, to deal with staph infection. I guess that would be the first wonder drug. This is sort of the next wonder drugs. They really changed diabetes. It took it from this horrible disease to a completely manageable disease. These glycogen management drugs, you just take them at a regular interval, and they've gotten so good now, you don't even need to take these big injections. I mean, they're really good. You can, diabetes is a very manageable disease. Unfortunately, what we're finding is these drugs aren't working. For example, in the U, whoa, that's pretty good. <laughs> For example, in the US, we've, um, we probably lose about 100,000 limbs every year uh, due to diabetes. I mean, lose, that's a euphemism for saying we have to chop them off. Why is that? Why is that happening? Well, it's happening, like I said, because the drugs aren't working. And why aren't the drugs working? Now, I know it's pretty late in the day for getting very technical, but you have to brush up on your biology at this point. These drugs are not working. It's getting, this is going to get very technical. These drugs are not working because if it, it turns out that for drugs to work, people have to take them. 
and people aren't taking them. It's not that they're not taking them that they're saying, oh, I don't want them. They're filling the prescription. They're just taking them 68% of the time. 68% of the time means, you know, 68% of the effectiveness for diabetes, which means limb loss, which means lots of consequences. There's nothing special about diabetes. For every disease that we know of, drug adherence is a problem. Here's a list of tables. So here's diabetes, 67.5, across a bunch of studies. These numbers vary from context to context. Here's HIV. You remember when HIV was this horribly deadly disease? We found these antiretrovirals. We thought these were miracle drugs. Well, now we have this problem. Their adherence is only about 88%. Now, there's a misleading aspect to this table. See, diabetes is a pretty linear production function, by which I mean that you take 68%, roughly you get 68% effectiveness. HIV, unfortunately not. 88% does not mean 88% efficacy. It means far less efficaciousness. So that's one reason HIV is proving to be a big problem. But it's true everywhere. I mean, end-stage renal disease is one I find quite striking. Um, <clears throat> a common example is you've been waiting for, you've been waiting for a kidney transplant. Um, and you get the kidney transplant. And once you get it, you get to take immunosuppressants. And guess what? People don't take immunosuppressants. And some kidneys are lost. It's such an extreme problem that one of the screens you use to give somebody a kidney is an assessment of whether they will take their drugs. Guess what turns out to be an extremely good predictor of whether someone will take their drugs? Across countries, it's true within the US. It's true within India. It's true anywhere you look. Income. The poor are the least likely to take their drugs. Now, before you think this is kind of an obvious thing, you might be saying, oh, newsflash, drugs cost money. Big surprise that the poor don't spend on something. Actually, it is a surprise, because you pay a copay for your drugs. On Medicaid, there's zero copay for drugs. So in fact, the poor face a lower price, in fact, no price. And it's still the case that there's a big effect. Why? This has nothing to do with borrowing. This is taking a pill. Let me go to another place. Let's go to parenting. There's a lot of really interesting work done by sociologists and qualitative researchers and some, and some psychologists on what it takes to be a good parent. And we actually know quite a bit, at least correlationally and in some cases causally, about you know, the things that go along with being a good parent. For example, you should engage more with your children. Talk to them, spend time with them, look at them. You should read to them. You should, for example, be consistent with them. Don't say one thing today and then the opposite thing the next day. It's almost like good advice for being a, what you want to do with your grad students as well. So I guess it applies to everything. And they find this out through a variety of means. But they also have found, just shockingly across context, a pretty good predictor of what makes a good parent. And guess what it is? That's right, our old friend income. The poor are just worse study after study. Let's try another behavior. How about this? <clears throat> Agricultural economics, or agronomists, agronomists study the production function of what it takes to make areas and, and farmland more productive. And they've discovered this unbelievable technology. It's actually quite amazing. It turns out to really increase crop yields by a lot, 50%. It's called weeding. You go out, and we've known this for thousands of years. Now, <clears throat> if you, I used to do field work a lot in India. And you can do this, you can see this whenever you do field work in a country where the plots of people are side by side, not like in parts of Africa where like, you know, the plots are all segregated. If you, if you can go side by side, you just walk down the field, and you'll see some plots are very tidy, well kept. It's like, it's like uh, your colleagues' offices. Some plots need a lot of weeding. So despite these huge returns, some people don't weed. It's like taking your drugs, being a good parent. Some people don't weed. Guess what turns out to be a great predictor of whether you weed or not? Income. The poorest farmers, the ones who can least afford not to weed, are the ones who don't weed. I could play this game with you all day. Here's the playbook. Find a behavior from some field. I mean, look, we talked about parenting, education, health, whatever it is. Find a behavior that you think is good, people won't do it enough, and guess who won't do enough of it? The poor. So to just say that the poor borrow is a little too small. There is a deeper connection between poverty and behavior of all kinds. Why? 
Why is there this connection? I think the reason we never talk about this, I'm pretty sure, and this is striking how widespread this is, even though we don't really talk about it, is it's pretty clear if I hadn't given the first part of this talk, and this is all I was saying, you would already have decided that I am some right-wing nut who is about to tell you the poor have deviant value. I may still be a right-wing nut, so don't. Let's do who may, well, they're dumb, they have limited ability, they are incompetent. Look, great, thank you for the evidence. This is exactly what we put in every single one. If you're honest, these individual differences would explain this behavior. In fact, you go further. You could say, hey, maybe this is the reason why the poor are poor. As people, they're myopic, they're, they do dumb things. Big surprise, they're poor. Well, let's put that on the possible. The other response to this relationship has been to say, it's not about people. Look, the poor don't have education. Maybe, maybe some of this stuff requires education. Maybe it has to do with the circumstances of where they live. Maybe it has to do with high prices. Sure, high prices didn't have to do with drugs, but maybe for parenting, it's a high opportunity. But what, different explanations. Different explanations for all of these behaviors. Stop lumping them together. It's all very complicated. And poverty is related to behavior because the poor live in complex, different environments. So these are the two candidates individual differences, and environment. I think I find both of these unsatisfying. The environment explanation I find deeply unsatisfying. Not that there aren't environment, surely the poor live in different environments, surely they have different opportunities. But when we see such a consistent relationship across all these behaviors, are we really saying there isn't some deeper explanation for why the poor behave worse on every dimension? That we're really going to use a different explanation each time? It just feels unsettling. The first one feels unsettling I suppose I shouldn't say from a scientific point of view, but from a scientific point of view, I'd say it's unsettling because, I mean, to be poor or have a poor farm in India is very different in a country that's very stratified and there's very little upward chance of mobility. How would you even explain why in that case? I mean, it's just, it's hard to explain why individual differences should be in this type of, in countries. It shows up everywhere, not just countries where there's great opportunity, if you believe such countries exist. What I want to tell you is that the scarcity mindset that I told you before, can explain why this is happening. That's what I'm going to end by doing, is to say, besides the benefits of scarcity, besides that scarcity leads us to borrow, that at some deeper level, that same force that scarcity captures our attention can explain why it is that for the poor, we see such worse behavior. So to understand why, I want to tell you about a little experiment that's more fun than all this heavy, weighty stuff. And then we'll get back to the heavy, weighty stuff. This is an experiment where we had people do a word search. So I had to find the word street. I know you won't listen to me until I show you where it is. So there it is. Okay. <laughs> then the word search cleared, and then they had to find the next word, tree. Then it cleared, and they had to find the next word, picture, and on and on. Half the subjects did that word search. The other half, we replaced the word street with hate. Replaced the word picture with donut. Oh, you see where this is going. Yeah, a lot of tasty words. What we were really interested in is, see, everybody searched for the word cloud, for example. Both conditions. But some people, before they look for a cloud, look for the word picture. And other people look for the word donut. We wanted to see how quickly did people find the word cloud if they search for the word picture versus if they just search for the word donut. It turns out that for a big fraction of our sample, not much of an effect. Just as quick to find the word cloud, whether or not you search for picture. But for about 40% of our sample, it made a big difference. Can you guess who? No? Dieters. So the non-dieters, no effect. Dieters, oh. If they had just searched for the donut, they were very slow to find the cloud. It's as if they were still thinking about the donut. This wasn't even a real donut. This was the letters D-O-N-U-T. What's going on here? It's kind of intuitive what's going on here. Scarcity captures attention. That means whatever you're trying to do, this process in your mind is saying, hey, donut? Donut? Which kind of makes it hard for you to focus on the task that you're focused on. Imagine someone next to you kept tapping you on the shoulder and said, hey, rent is due in a month. Do we have money for rent? That would get pretty annoying, but also pretty distracting and also quite hard to focus. In fact, I want you to imagine sitting down to a computer and trying to use it. And you try and surf the web. 
and it is going really slow. It is just painfully slow. You're like, who bought this computer? This is a slow computer. This is a terrible computer. Somebody should throw this away. This processor is just terrible. Then you realize, five minutes into this dreadful experience, oh, wait, I see what happened. There's a process in the background that's downloading a big file. Let me just stop that. All of a sudden, the computer is fast again. The problem was not the computer or the bandwidth that it had to access the internet. The problem was something else was clogging up that bandwidth. The mind is not that different. You've got a certain amount of bandwidth, and if something else is clogging up that bandwidth, for example, consistently thinking about how to make ends meet, of course you will have less bandwidth for the task that you're focusing on, much like these people who the minute that they thought a little bit about donut, they had less bandwidth to look for the word cloud. What I want to tell you is, in fact, scarcity does in some way, and poverty does in some way make you dumber. It's not that poor people are dumb. They have the same bandwidth. It's the same computer. But that the condition of poverty, by constantly tugging at our minds, makes you dumber. Not just dumber. I want to say that there's a resource called bandwidth. I'm not going to go into this at too much length. But that this resource underlies everything. You want to think clearly? The best way you can think about bandwidth is picture yourself tired. You think less clearly. You have less self-control. You learn less well. You have less memory. You're less creative. That's bandwidth. Tiredness is like a good simulator, if you will. If you want to understand behaviors, well, when your bandwidth is taxed, you snap at your kids. When your bandwidth is taxed, you forget to do some small task, or you look like an idiot. You forget to take your drugs. You eat less healthy. You choose badly. You loaf around. There are a lot of behaviors that follow from bandwidth. So I'm going to make a bold assertion. I'm going to say that by itself, directly poverty taxes bandwidth. How am I going to do that? I'm going to tell you there are two sort of core psychological components of bandwidth. The first is what I'm going to call executive function. Executive function is that capacity we have to restrict the immediate impulse we have that immediate impulse to do something or say something. Fluid intelligence is the other component, the ability to think reason, reason clearly. I won't get into details of how we measure it, because we're running out of time, but take these as two measures. And then I'm going to go to a mall in New Jersey. This is a mall in New Jersey, Quaker Bridge Mall. It's an exciting mall if you haven't been there. Um, in fact, yeah, I would encourage you all to go. Um, and it's not like every other mall you've been to, trust me. So in this mall, we said to people, we want you to take two tests. The first test is this test of executive function. The other is this test of fluid intelligence. These are very standard tests that psychologists use to measure. For example, this is Raven's matrices. This is how you would measure IQ, one component of IQ. So we have people take these tests. Some people are poor. Some people are rich. That by itself won't tell us much, because poor, rich, so many other things differ. Did we even measure income? Who knows? What we need to do is we need to do the equivalent of the word search study that we got people to think about donuts. So we need to get people to think a little bit about money. So for half the subjects, before they took this test, we said to them, hey, here's John. John needs $2,000 because his car broke down. How would he get it? It's nothing to do with your money. It's fictional. It's about John. It's, but it got them thinking a little bit about money, just like the words D-O-N-U-T. So here's what happened. There is some difference in intelligence, in this simple example, small, between poor and rich, if we don't get them to think about money. But simply get them to think a little bit about money, and all of a sudden, huge differences in intelligence. Here's, here's, a flu, here's a executive function, impulse control. Actually, here you see a bigger difference before we do anything. But get them to think about money, and you see a huge difference. Now, what this tells you is, Getting the poor to think a little bit about money has a pretty big effect. And I'm going to tell you this number is big. I mean, like, very big. But I, I will tell you how big in a second. That's a pretty big effect. But that's not perfect. Because after all, what I tried to tell you was that being poor taxes your bandwidth. I didn't tell you being poor taxes your bandwidth when some weird researcher gives you a question about John. Well, how would I test that hypothesis? By the way, I should tell you, even when we redid this study, we've done this study like 15 times. Even when you redid this study and gave people very strong incentives to get all these questions right, you find at least as big of an effect, which is ironic because the poor need the money more. 
So what did we do? Well, let me tell you about a different study we did back in India. Now, this notice is totally different populations. When I say poor, I mean poor in a very fluid sense. It's now we're talking about poor farmers in India. And these are sugarcane farmers. Sugarcane is a very interesting crop. The way sugarcane works is it, it lasts for about a year, and you harvest it at the end of the year. Now, one thing, other thing I should tell you is that because of the way it's planted, the harvest date is very different for different people. So my crop could be harvested in June, and Doug's crop could be harvested in September. But while he's still waiting around for his harvest, I've done my harvest, and we're right next to each other. Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because when I was a Harvard grad student, Harvard had this policy of giving their stipends to their grad students once a semester. What that meant was I got my entire stipend in September, and that had to last till February or January. And you can imagine what happened. December was a very tough month. A very, and in fact, April at the other end was another very cruel month, to use T.S. Eliot's words. Why? Because the cash from before had run out. Things were very dire at this end. This was a bad idea, a terrible policy. Well, these sugarcane farmers are on the Harvard plan. They get paid once a year when their harvest comes in. So as you can imagine, the month before harvest, they're poor. The month after harvest, they're well off. Now you don't need anybody to go and prime or get them to think about money. I get the same person when they're poor and when they're rich. Now, other things may be different. Maybe they're working different hours. Trust me when I tell you things like hours worked are not different. We control for that, that nutritional inputs are not different. The main thing for these farmers is that they're rich one, well off in one month and poor in the next month. And because two farmers next to each other can be pre and post harvest. I'm not just telling you it's about harvest month. There isn't a harvest month. You can take out the entire month effect. So now we can go and redo our study. We can exactly test them on IQ and executive function. And guess what? You find exactly the same thing. Pre harvest, getting far fewer Ravens items right relative to post harvest. Pre harvest, they're much slower on this executive function test, make many more errors. So, this is not a slide that's telling you to wake up. Don't worry if you're sleeping by now. I'm happy and I'm OK. Um, I'm putting this slide up because I told you these effects were big. So let me tell you how big they are. Remember I also told you that the best part of psychology is it's like a practical joke? So there's a part of psychology that is sleep psychology. And they study the effects of sleep and how people sleep and sleep well, blah, blah. And a bunch of experiments are interested in the effects of sleep on cognitive function. So they bring people into the lab and say, oh, welcome to the lab. You guys. Here's a very nice, comfortable bed. It's quiet here. The climate is perfect. You can set it to what you like. Sleep away. You guys, welcome to the lab. Tonight, you'll be getting no sleep at all. In fact, just to make sure, I have a graduate student here. They're going to sit right next to you. And if it looks like you even close your eyes, they're going to shake you awake. Next morning, 9 AM, you're very well rested. You guys, on the other hand, not so well rested. You pulled an all-nighter. And if there's anything I learned in my undergraduate years, in fact, I think this is the only thing anyone learns in any undergraduate program, <laughs> it's that after an all-nighter, you're an idiot. That essay you wrote that you thought was just brilliant at 4 AM, and you realize later it was brilliant gibberish. So now they do cognitive function tests. And what do they find? They find, in fact, that the IQ of this population is dropped a lot. The executive function of this population has dropped a lot. These effects are so big, for example, that if you're going to be on the road with a drunk driver or a sleepy driver, pick the drunk driver. It's not a joke. Pick the drunk driver. You'll be safer. Why am I telling you all this? Well, that gives us an interesting calibration. It helps us understand how big the effects that I just showed you are. It turns out the effects of poverty are anywhere between 2 thirds and 80% of this effect every day. It's as if the poor are pulling an all-nighter every day. These are not small effects. Poverty taxes bandwidth dramatically because this one force that I told you about that constantly calls to mind. Now, why does this happen for the poor? I started by talking about scarcity. Well, why does this happen for the busy? And in a way, it does. You've all experienced this. You're on deadline. You go home, and your kid is talking to you, and you're like, who is this kid? Where does this kid show up from? Why are they annoying me? You snap at them. You say things you shouldn't. 
And it only gets so bad for you. You know why? Because at some point, you realize this bandwidth hack. And you start uttering words like life-work balance. You start taking on fewer projects. You might take a vacation. The poor also realize this. Unfortunately, they can't utter words like life poverty balance. I just feel like I'm focusing too much on this poverty stuff. Take a, <laughs> take a little vacation from this. Maybe take a few weeks and be rich for a while. Then I'll go back to this poor thing. I mean, I am committed to this poor thing. Just, just need a little break from it. As you can see, while the underlying forces of scarcity are the same, the way it can play itself out in the world can be very different. I'll give you an example. Take diets. You've all had the experience of a diet becoming too taxing. What do you do? You give up. Take being lonely. The lonely, experiencing a form of social scarcity, have the exact same forces that we talked about. They're in a social interaction. They can't help but think about, does this person like me? That's a, quite a big distortion. Guess what? They can't just say, I'm going to stop being lonely for a while. And in fact, the lonely show pretty big bandwidth taxes as well. So while the forms of scarcity are similar and the forces they evoke are similar, the consequences can be quite different. So let me just conclude with a few policy lessons. The first lesson is one for all of you about time. This is a lesson that happened to me about three years ago. I went to dinner with a bunch of friends. It was a great dinner. It was really good. The food was good. The conversation was scintillating. It was great. I'm not kidding. It was really good. And then I thought to myself afterwards, what happened? I mean, it's the same old friends. They haven't gotten more interesting. If anything, they got less interesting. I'm sure they say the same thing about me. The restaurant wasn't a new restaurant. It's like the food had gotten. What, what happened? Then I realized what happened. Around 3 in the afternoon, I dropped my cell phone in the toilet. So at that dinner, I didn't have my cell phone with me. Now, it's not as if I would have been checking my cell phone during dinner. But you know what I would have done? When someone went, got to, you know, when I was waiting for my friends to show up, or maybe on the cab ride there, I would have checked my cell phone. There would have been an email there that said, oh, this thing we're stuck on, and we don't know if we'll meet, make our deadline, or maybe this project is short on money, blah, blah, blah. What, would I, what, was, what am I doing with the cell phone? What I'm doing with the cell phone is I am conducting that own lab experiment on me. I am priming myself with all those things that are exactly going to distract me during the dinner, that are going to get me thinking about the stuff that I shouldn't be thinking about. I am putting D-O-N-U-T in front of my face when I don't want to. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we're very good when we're busy at trying to manage time, but we're not so good at managing bandwidth. This is a bandwidth management mistake. We think of ourselves as being short on time when we really ought to think of ourselves as being short on bandwidth. And bandwidth doesn't behave like time. For example, squeeze in five minutes to check your email between you know, meetings, you might have just made a bandwidth mistake. Because now that email is going to keep haunting you for the rest of the next meeting. The same is true of poverty. When we think of the poor, what do we think? We think they're short on money. I would argue we should think they're short on bandwidth. So my first policy lesson is just going to be very simple. It's going to be to say, for the poor, we really have to focus on managing bandwidth. What's an example of that? Let me give you an example. This is a FAFSA form. Some of you are all too familiar with this FAFSA form. This is an interesting program, FAFSA. It's intended to give financial aid to low-income individuals. Imagine I said to you, yeah, the FAFSA form, it's going to cost $2,000. You would have been like, are you an idiot? This is a form aimed at low-income individuals. What part of do you not understand low-income? Low-income means low-income, so don't charge them a lot. I'll say, oh, got it, got it, got it. The form is 40 pages. Yeah, fine, whatever. You're taxing people on bandwidth. You have no worry taxing people on bandwidth. You should be as worried, if not more worried, because the poor are not just short on money, they're short on bandwidth. Asking them to do things that are going to be very cognitively taxing is very expensive. Conditional cash transfers, where we say to people, oh, you need to follow these conditions in order to get the cash. I'm not saying they're not good programs. Surely they're good programs. But each condition you add is another bandwidth tax. And in the language of economics, just like money taxes are regressive and disproportionately target the poor, these results, these results suggest bandwidth taxes are regressive. In fact, things are so bad. As economists, what annoys us most is when there's a resource that's not being accounted for in calculation. No cost-benefit calculation I know of, of policies, accounts for bandwidth taxes. That's crazy. 
Okay, let me tell you about another thing. This is the B, uh, B-17, the Flying Fortress. This is World War II. I'm not, I don't have any fetish about World War II. I just have two examples. Don't think I'm British. Um, <laughs> the B-17 had this like funny problem during World War II. Pilots would be landing this plane. It's not funny, ha ha funny. No, no, no. The pilots would be landing this plane, and as it was hitting the ground, they would retract the landing gear. This is what is known in aviation as a bad idea. Because now the plane crashes into the ground, sometimes the pilot survives, oftentimes the pilot survives, the plane is gone, in the middle of war, we've just lost the bomber. The, <clears throat> the military was not happy. They sent in Lieutenant Chapanis to investigate what was going on into, inside these pilots' heads. There was a presumption that probably they knew what was going on. Excellent airmen commit no errors. And so odds are we made some mistake in training or selecting people. But maybe let's figure out what's going on. So Chapanis went in, he talked to the, the, the pilots that were alive. He tried to understand what was going on. And his first clue that there was something wrong was that this didn't happen with the cargo planes ever. This was only happening with the bombers. And then Chapanis had an insight. In fact, a brilliant insight. He said, I'm going to stop looking inside. He was a psychologist. He said, I'm going to stop looking inside people's heads. I'm going to look inside the cockpit. And what he found inside the cockpit was fascinating. This is not exactly it, but it's close. What he found was the lever for retracting the landing gear looked like something like this, roughly. Not very much. Picture it like this. And there was a lever right next to it. Looked just like it. Operated in the same way. And that was the lever for lowering the flaps. When you land, you should lower the flaps. You should pull this. Do not pull this. Now, what a great cockpit design. <laughs> pull this. Do not pull that. Not the best design. In fact, you should all be grateful for Chapanis. Chapanis' insight here led to an entire field called human factors engineering that's changed how we design cockpits. They have a bunch of ideas, but their basic idea is stupid. Of course excellent airmen commit errors. The best trained pilot will commit errors. It will just happen. It is the job of the cockpit to minimize the chance of error. It is the job of the cockpit so that when errors do happen, they don't have big consequences. It is the job of the cockpit when errors do happen to have alarms to tell you, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Most aviation experts believe about 90% of the reduction in aircraft uh, crashes since the 50s, 90% is due to better cockpit design. The reduction in human error. Not because the wings have gotten more safe, it's just because we've gotten rid of these. Why am I telling you all this? Well, if this simple insight, excellent airmen do commit errors, and it's the job of cockpits to be fault tolerant, works for airplanes, why don't we have this for policy? If the poor are bandwidth taxed, of course they will make mistakes. Of course errors will happen. So shouldn't policy and a goal of policy to be fault tolerant? I don't mean about incentives versus you know, motivating people. Sure, motivate people all you want, but the truth is the best motivated person is going to commit an error. There is no more motivated agent than a pilot sitting in that cockpit. It's not like the pilot was thinking, hey, what's the worst that could happen if I retract this landing gear? <laughs> I mean, maybe if they gave me a little pay for performance scheme, but, but they didn't. No, <laughs> perfectly motivated, but errors will happen. Our poverty, our policy towards poverty, remarkably fault intolerant. And we could be fault tolerant. What's an example? You sign up for a community college, you sign up to take a class. The bandwidth tax being what it is, you miss a few classes. What just happens? You can't go back. After you miss a few classes, you're just behind. Every new class gets harder and harder. The very nature of classroom instruction in a community college is designed to be fault intolerant. It need not be. If we're starting 10 calculus classes, why not stagger them? So that if you miss a class, will you just step back to, the class, to class two, which is still where you are? There are many ways we could be fault tolerant. If our goal was to recognize people will just make mistakes, people will just miss parts of a training program, this will just happen. Finally, let me, let me end on a positive note, and then I'll stop. I've been pretty negative here with the bandwidth tax, but I actually want to be very positive. Take an example. Um, one of the biggest bandwidth taxes of low-income individuals is finding daycare. So picture we had a program that provided daycare. 
what would we do to assess its effectiveness? We would say, did it increase labor supply of the mothers? Yeah, okay, we might find some honest facts. I would say we might be missing the biggest effect. That daycare program might be creating six IQ points for all we know. It might be making better parents. It might be making better drug adherents. It might be doing all sorts of stuff that we have no idea about. A financial product that simply moved harvest income from the end of the year and smoothed it out. Again, if you just look at the finances of the program, you'll say, oh, it did something. That might be making farmers weed better. That might be doing all sorts of stuff. See, I think because we don't think of bandwidth as a resource and we don't think about managing it, we don't realize that some policies can have disproportionate impact far beyond where we're looking. A daycare program could be a health program that gets people to take their drugs and come in for exams. We would never think of it that way, but through bandwidth that could be happening. So that's all by way of saying some of our programs might be having more far-reaching effects than we're even looking for. Because before this talk, would you have ever said, hey, let's, see, let's measure the impact of this on IQ? But maybe we ought to start to. All right, thank you. If there are any questions, I could take a few questions. I think, I think you have to go to the mic. I think. Uh, I think. Yes. Yes? Okay, yes. good. Yeah. Please use the microphone. I, I think it is. It's a great question. I think one of the things I've skirted completely in this talk is, what does scarcity mean? Is it absolute? Is it relative? And it's a psychological concept, so it's hard to know. And if I were to give my gut answer, what I would say is, it surely is a bit of both, by which I mean, it is obviously painful to not be able to feed your kids or to feed yourself. And that's a sort of a very primitive pain and someone living in Trenton, New Jersey doesn't have to suffer that need. On the other hand, it's pretty painful also to say to your kid, I know you've done really well in class, and I know you're doing well, but no birthday gift for you. Pretty painful too. And so if you imagine that there's sort of a hierarchy of sort of desires, I'm pretty sure the effects of scarcity will bite the most, more at these low levels of absolute poverty, because there are very primitive desires that will call attention. But Human beings are social animals, and so not being able to do things for your kids, feeling poor relative to your neighbors, those things will have, all, I mean, if not the same force, have some force. And so my guess is that we'll, if we, this stuff builds out, we'd find these effects are pretty big in Trenton, which is what we found in our mall study. But yes, I think your intuition is right, that they'll probably hit with a little more force or more force in India, and perhaps with even greater force in parts of Africa where there's even greater force. Well, so I think the harvest study is what comes closest to, to, for me to guess, yes. That is, that, now, I want to be careful. That doesn't mean giving money is a solution. See, there's a parable here is the psychology of scarcity has a problem, but so does the psychology of abundance. It's not like giving me all this time to do this chapter miraculously solved my problem. Because during the abundance period, I was making a set of other mistakes, which is kind of what set it up. And I'm sure we would find that. It's like we do find that during the period of abundance, the farmer's not putting aside enough, but we all do that. So in a weird way, if I were to think of what's the ideal social, I'm not gonna propose social engineering, but the ideal social engineering and the challenge of scarcity is how to make sure we have the right amount of it in the right time and place. Enough scarcity to motivate us to do the right thing, but not so much scarcity as to create a bandwidth tax or cause us to be prolific borrowers. Any other questions?
Yeah, so I think that, I don't know that I would think about priming people with abundance, but I, I would say one thing, which is once we understand the mechanism of scarcity, if, we, if you believe what I've told you, which is that there are these intrusive thoughts, maybe the most wild conjecture I would make is there is a literature, a growing literature in psychology that has to do with intrusive thoughts and that actually shows perhaps interventions that can help people manage intrusive thoughts. It was not designed for the poor. It was actually designed for people with eating disorders or uh, sort of just trying to teach people how to live better lives. It's cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness. These are all interventions designed for how to teach people how to keep intrusive thoughts from affecting everyday life. And these interventions are interesting because they kind of tell us we're bad at it. For example, if you have an intrusive thought, something that keeps calling at you, what do you tend to do? You tend to push it away, which is exactly the worst thing to do. And so one thing I might guess that might make a difference, this is what I would hazard a guess, is that it's possible that mindfulness training, at least I would like to see if mindfulness training can reduce the bandwidth tax amongst low-income individuals, that would be something interesting if someone were to try as an experiment. Because if that's the mechanism, you can imagine seeing that playing some role. And as for gamification, I mean, I don't quite know how to, I mean, family feud was a game, but uh, outside of, but I do think that it's possible that, especially in the implementation of some of these interventions, it could play a pretty big role. Any other questions? Yeah, it's a great question. I think procrastination, especially when we have abundance, I think this is exactly where we just have to remember the dual roles of scarcity. It, scarcity really does help us. And so we don't want to just say abundance is great. That's like the worst outcome, too. And I think that as a time management issue, what's challenging is to figure out how do you ensure that you have the right amount of scarcity for the task. You see what I mean? So it's like, here's an example. Like, in writing the chapter, if I had a very tight deadline from the very beginning, I would end up with a crappy chapter. Because certain types of cognitive tasks need lack of pressure. Like some people call this fanning out. You kind of need to be creative and opening up. But at some point, you fanned out enough. And what you really need to do is fan in and put the stuff on paper. So it's almost like if you're thinking about that task, what you would like is abundance early and then scarcity late. There are other tasks where you just need scarcity all the time. You're having a meeting with oh, I don't know, graduate students, you just need to say, all right, 20 minutes, get to your point. 20 minutes, get to your point. Of course, you have a meeting with the graduate student very early, and they just need time to explore that. So I think part of the challenge of time management is figuring out how to ensure enough scarcity that you are productive, but not so much that you're not. And I think that is, at least in my own time, that's what I kind of, that's what I said bandwidth management is largely about that. It's about how to understand that each task has its own bandwidth demand, and how to manage Thank you.